Okay, so a little bit about myself. For those of you who don't already know me, my name is Dr. Jonathan Lee, and I've been very passionately interested in this topic of sports nutrition, bodybuilding, weight loss, really since the age of around 12. And um, it all started when I went into my older brother's bedroom. And this is going back a few years. I don't want to tell you how old I am, but put it this way, I found a VHS copy of a documentary entitled Pumping Iron. Now, I'm sure that you all remember what VHS is. It's what we used to watch movies on before DVDs, right? I'm yeah. sure some of you, you know, there might be some younger people who don't know. And for the really young people, DVDs is what we used to watch movies on before Netflix, right? So I found this VHS documentary of a documentary called Pumping Iron. And has anyone heard of this documentary? No. No? Okay. Um, so it's yeah. a documentary. Yep. Who's heard of it? Isn't that Arnold Schwarzenegger? Arnold Schwarzenegger, that's right. Before he was famous, he was a bodybuilder before he was an actor. And um, I thought this was the coolest thing ever. It was Arnold Schwarzenegger and Lou Ferrango, who later on became uh, the Incredible Hulk in the first series back in the 70s. And I thought this was the coolest thing ever. So that's really where it all started. But at the age of 12, I'm way too young to go to the gym, right? So I waited till my 16th birthday, and then I joined a local gym in the area on my birthday. And then I was going to the gym quite regularly. And within a year, I had a rock hard body. I was looking pretty cool, man. And then a year later, on my 18th birthday, I took these pictures. Let's see if this will work now. There you go. That was me. It's pretty crappy quality, but that was me on my 18th birthday. I was 9% body fat. And uh, I was like, yeah, not bad. I was looking all right. Had a six pack and everything. It sounds all fine and dandy, doesn't it? This is interactive, man. I, got, I need feedback from you guys. Can you hear me? Or? If I don't get feedback, I think maybe there's something wrong with the microphone. No, it's all good, man. You look okay, good. cool. Yeah, so I, was, I was looking all right. I was looking all right. But something happened, you know, because it wasn't all fine and dandy. I think after around 18, I started to gain fat and not just a little bit of fat, loads and loads and loads of fat. And I couldn't understand this. I was training all the time. Um, I thought I was eating okay, but evidently not. And I'm going to show you what I look like five years later you ready yes okay that's yeah. what i looked like when i was 23 28 percent body fat i went from nine okay. percent to 28 percent. can you all see the screens yes yeah so you know you can see quite a difference there you know and it was very frustrating because i really could not figure out why i was gaining all this weight what was working for me when i was 16 17 wasn't working for me so i thought hmm I'm going to go on a diet. That's what most people do, isn't it? When they gain too much weight, they go on a diet. So I decided, yeah. and this is back in the 90s, you know, before the internet. I just went on any fad diet you can name. So I went from the worst diets, the best diets, bad to good, Dallas, Texas to Hollywood. I'd done it all. And it was always the same thing. You know, I'd lose a little bit of weight. I will hit a plateau and then gain the weight again. Does that sound familiar to anyone? Yeah. Yeah. Interaction, yeah. my friend, interaction. Yes, yes, yes. So, you know, you yes, can all yes. to weight loss plateaus and things like that. I went to the doctors for a health checkup and the doctor told me to take my top off. I took my top off, oh. and you know what he said? He said, you're a beast. No. Said, I'm a beast? The doctor, my doctor, you know, he said, you're a beast. I said, I'm a beast? He goes, no, 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 no. You're not a beast. You are obese. You're fat. You, you need to go on a diet. That's what he told me. <laughs> Well, I said, what do you think I've been doing for wow. the last six months? I've been on every diet there is. And he said, oh, you just got to move around more and eat less. That's what he said. Move more and eat less. I'm thinking, well, thanks a lot, mate. That didn't help. So I was very, very, very frustrated. But I'm not 20, I was extremely frustrated. I thought nothing works, you know. Um, I thought I was one of those people who's genetically obese, you know what I mean? One of those big boned, can't lose weight kind of people. That's what I thought I was. Um, so I decided to educate myself. I went to uni and I studied nutrition and uh, medical science at one of those posh universities in London called King's College. You've all heard of King's College, right? Yeah. Mm. Yeah. So I got myself a degree. And um, I think what I learned at university was how to really critically analyze research papers and essentially separate fact from opinion or fact from fiction. And... Um, in more recent years, since the onset of the internet, because it's going back in the, the early-ish, mid-2000, 2000, 2010, 
I started to discover some very well-respected uh, scientists, researchers, ex-bodybuilders, and personal trainers. They've dedicated their whole lives to body recomposition, which is a fancy way of saying fat loss and muscle growth. I would very strongly suggest, in addition to checking me out, of course, I would suggest checking out uh, some of these people, Lyle McDonald, Alan Aragon, uh, Brad Schoenfeld, Eric Helms, uh, Michael Matthews. Does any of these names sound familiar, by the way? No. Nope. Okay. But anyway, these people, they, that's, that's all they do. They literally spend all their life researching what the truth behind fat loss and muscle growth. In the last six years, I was the, the thing about me is that I don't like bullshit very much. Pardon my language. I, li I, li I like to cut to the core, you know, and that's something about me is I spent the best part of six, seven years sifting through loads of long, boring, complicated science and pointless drivel. And I wanted to amalgamate all the information in very relevant, easy to digest, simple, easy to understand, elementary almost level books. That's what I've done, hence my Lean Gains book collection. Uh, there's a little bit of shameless promotion here, but you can check out all these books on Amazon. I've got great reviews and it tells you everything you need to know about fat loss, muscle growth. Um, I've, I've just come out with a diet book this year called Lean Meals for Everyone. So that's why you can see that can't you on the screen the book collection there yes yeah so that's 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 a little bit about me but why are you here why what 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 brought you along to this seminar very interesting question what is a weight loss plateau by the way someone just asked me explain what a weight loss plateau is what is a weight loss plateau do you think i've got it's it when, it's when you reach certain weights mm. and regardless of how much exercise you do and mm. how much dieting you do you mm. just don't lose any more or gain Absolutely. more if that's what you want to do. Absolutely, yes. And so I lose weight. And um, that's that's something I'm going to be touching on a bit later on today. So does any of this sound uh, familiar? Like if you're struggling to stick to any diet, burn fat, break through the weight loss plateaus, gain muscle, achieve a lean, uh, lean physique, uh, find strength in the gym. So a lot of people, they might feel a bit energy, um, feel a bit tired after going to the gym for a while and, and staying on a uh, sustained diet, things like that. Is that sound of interest to anybody here? Yeah, that's yeah. Yeah. yeah, cool. And also, I'm going to kind of go over body recomposition, which again is a fancy name of saying fat loss and muscle growth. So I'm going to try to touch on quite a number of topics. Now you got to, you know, you got to understand that this can be a massive, massive, ten hour talk if I want to. But I'm going to try to, as I said earlier, try to condense all the relevant information. So it's called how to get the perfect body, isn't it? But what is the perfect body? Is there such thing as a perfect body or is it all subjective? It's what you want, really, at the end of the day, isn't it? It's what, what you want to look like that makes Absolutely. you feel confident. So really, it's the perfect body for you. It's what you... Um, and I'm going to go on to the next slide now. Because I've got, I've got to, like, I've got to basically um, do a little disclaimer. If you have any body dysmorphia issues, this probably isn't for you. Because at the end of the day, you have to love yourself. Okay, that's the most important thing. Um, having a great body doesn't mean that much if you don't love yourself. So um, I'm going to give you a politically correct, crowd-pleasing answer to what is the perfect body. Okay, the perfect body is the one that allows me, myself, and I to attain peace of mind today, tomorrow, and forevermore. That sounds like a nice, happy, crowd-pleasing answer, doesn't it? So that's like the politically incorrect answer. That's pretty much what all of us want, a lean physique. Am I right? Yes. Cool. Yes. Cool. Okay. In order to achieve a perfect body, quote unquote, we have to really focus on fat loss and to some degree muscle gain, ideally both. You with me? Yes. Good, good. Really, we're looking at chiseling away that fat and exposing that lean muscle tissue beneath. So the million dollar question is, can you achieve the body of your dreams without taking drugs, without resorting yes. to steroids? Hell yes. Hell yes. And I'm going to just show you some testimonials before I continue. So this guy is from America, and he basically followed what I'm going to be talking about today. Um, he was very happy with his physique. Now, this was a really impressive before and after. It took him around a year to achieve that look. Wow. Right? Almost like two different people. Jesus. Yeah. All this, this guy, this guy again from America. Everything uh -huh. I'm talking about, these are real people, real results. And then there's some, some of the other people I've worked with, they've all got great, you know, these, these are people who've actually, actually. Um, I'd call them success stories, really. 
so they've achieved the body that they've wanted simply by going over what simply by applying what i'm going to be talking about today and okay. does that sound like something that interests you yeah, yeah. man i can't wait yes please cool cool and that's my that oh, by the way that's me as well 10 weeks after i started my lean gains journey i lost something like 10 percent body fat in 10 weeks so remember that horrible picture i showed you before so this is my mm. first 10 weeks and i lost quite a bit of fat Lost a little bit of muscle, but that's all right. You know, so I was pretty happy with that result. So in answer to the question again, is it possible for me or you to attain the body of your dreams? Again, the answer is yes, but only if you do things the right way. Okay. So I'm going to talk about burning fat now. A lot of people say, how do you burn fat? And if I was to ask anybody, how do you burn fat? Exercise and watching what you eat. Okay, I'm going to write down. Okay, so I'm going to write down all you want. So, exercise, okay. Uh, someone said increased metabolism. Calorie deficit. Calories, okay. Anyone else? Well, you've got, to, you've got to move more than what you actually take in. So, move more, okay. So, calorie burning, yeah. Mm. Anyone else? Any other answers? Not missing meals. Not missing meals, okay. So, um, call that nutrient timing, yep. Gain muscle. Running, okay, someone said running, okay. That's a gain muscle. Gaining muscle, okay. So I'm, I'm literally writing down all your answers because um, I think we can come to con some kind of consensus in a bit. So all these great, great answers. You know what I'm gonna do? I'm gonna go over what a lot of people do and the first thing they do when they like let's say it's 2nd of January you've eaten, eaten way too much over Christmas and you want to lose weight have you all been there before or was it just yeah like, yeah and so most people what do they do they tend to go on a diet right and as a general rule of thumb if you're over 15 to 18 percent body fat as a man or over 23 percent body fat as a woman um, most people would say okay maybe you should consider dieting Again, this is if you want to go for that kind of lean athletic physique. Um, this isn't the case with everybody, but certainly with a large proportion of people. I'd say if they're over 15-18%, um, focusing on dieting is probably the best thing. Now, some people ask me when I was doing personal training, how do you assess your body fat percentage? Does anyone know? Shout it out if you know. Yeah, I've them. got some brilliant scales that do it for you. Yeah. <laughs> okay um you can also yeah you can also head over to my website leangains.co.uk um if you go to the blog section under calories and um body fat percentage i've i can uh, i can show you some really cool calculators you can use for that um i've also if you, if you look on the screen it also gives you an idea what the percentages are if you're just going on visuals but um yeah i'd say first of all work out your body fat percentage and then consider also you can it's going how you feel if you want to lose more fat and look more lean then obviously dieting is key now have you ever been on google and typed in how do you lose weight yeah and are you confused at the end of it because <laughs> yeah. you know when I, when I wrote my first book when i was researching and these are literally you can see the screen right yeah. yeah, yeah. these are literally real life quotes I got from various YouTube channels and I put them all together just to highlight how confusing the misinformation is out there. If you want to lose weight, count your calories. Train six times a day, lift heavy and eat fish. Eat every three hours and do hit four times a week. Eat whatever you want before between 12 and 6 and fast from 6 till 12. Cut out the dairy. If you don't eat enough meat, you don't have enough testosterone. That's bad. If you want to lose weight, go vegan. Meat is pumped full of antibiotics and pesticides and will kill you. Stay away from soy. Eat more soy. Lift heavy weights three times a week. Avoid lifting heavy weights. If you look at all that and put them all together, you're going to end up confused. Am I right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that was me. Yeah. And then there's so many diets out there. It's like, okay, you've got the three to one diet, five to Cambridge, Atkins, Warrior diet, all these diets. It's like, which one's the right diet to go on? And so, understandably, a lot of people get very confused. Um, because it's like some diets work, some diets don't work, right? Yeah. Yep. So do diets work or do they not work? Which diets are the best diets to go on? If you had to pick a diet, which one would it be? The one, the one that you can do, the one that you can sustain all the Absolutely. time. Absolutely, the one you can sustain. Because you can get yeah. results on all these diets. Cambridge diet, that guy looks pretty good. Good results, right? 
five two diet. These are all real people who've done these diets. Uh, Slim Fast, Weight Watchers, Slimming World, uh, Wells Me Connolly. They've all they've all you know all success stories. Even some people say go vegan. Some people lose weight doing vegan. Not everybody, of course. <laughs> uh, keto diet. You know, there's loads of that. I'm gonna ask you a question. That's a quiz time. What's the one thing that all diets have in common? Uh, sugar. Huh? Fat. Fat. They, they promise you that you can lose weight. Hmm? They promise you that you can lose weight. Yep, but from a scientific they point try... of view, what would they all have in common? Oh. Just purely no, no, no. They try to change so. your eating habits. Mm -hmm. mm. Absolutely. So re reduce, all, reduce the size of the portions that you eat. Yeah, absolutely. But what is it that all diets have in common? Every single diet. Uh, they're horrible. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> they're very horrible. They're very horrible. But I'm going to be a bit more specific and I'm going to tell you, you, as someone said earlier, you need to eat fewer calories than you burn, regardless of diet, in order to lose weight. So that is how you lose weight, is by eating fewer calories. Okay? Now, yeah, that's... That, that's yeah exactly um who said that by the way sorry i did elaine elaine okay excellent yeah excellent. so that's that's the right answer now i'm gonna back that up i'm not just gonna say it. i'm gonna back it up with um okay sorry I, I forgot about this slide yeah so a lot of people like there was um a really famous discussion on joe rogan between um I can't remember the guy's name now but it was uh oh gosh gary torbs have you heard of gary torbs no uh, he's the one who goes on about low carb, low carb, low carb, and um, he's sold millions of books. Um, and uh, he's a very strong proponent of low carbs is the only way that you can lose weight. And um, he falsely said that even if you eat more calories than you burn, you can lose weight. And he was shamefully uh, disproven on the Joe Rogan show with the, um, I can't remember the other guy, he was having a debate with this nutritionist. But anyway, Point being that you have to be on a calorie restriction, even if you're doing keto. And don't take my word for it. There's a lot of science that proves, that backs it up. These are some very famous papers. And there are, believe me, there are literally hundreds and hundreds of um, papers that prove that point. But these are just some of them. Um, you can screenshot that if you like. I'm going to put the final nail in the coffin, OK? Who's heard of a guy called Mark Hall? Or the Twinkie? I guy? haven't. No. Now this guy, this, this guy, Mark, Mark Hobb, he's actually a professor in human nutrition in uh, America. And um, all of his students, every single day, would come up to him and say, how do you lose weight? How do you lose weight? I'm going on this diet. I'm going on the juice diet. Is that the best diet? And he would always say the same thing. Calorie restriction, calorie restriction, calorie restriction. So one day he decided to prove his point. He actually went on a calorie restricted diet consisting of junk food. And when I say junk food, I'm talking about Twinkies, I'm talking about Oreos, Doritos, sugary cereals, everything that you're not supposed to eat if you want to lose weight. But he did it on a calorie restriction. He ate 1,800 calories a day, and he was burning 2,600 calories a day. And do you know what happened? No, he lost weight. He lost weight because he was on a calorie restriction. And people thought, that can't be right. He's eating sugary cereals and Oreos, and he's still losing weight. That's impossible. But yet he was able to lose weight. And not only that, his BMI yeah. went down and his body fat percentage went down. Hmm? Yeah, but was he not a candidate for um, diabetes too? Absolutely. Not. <laughs> Believe me, look, I'm not advocating this diet. It's very unhealthy, yeah. very, very unhealthy. But I'm doing it just to prove a point that it's the calorie restriction is how you lose the weight. Um, there are other people, John Cisner, oh he went God. on the McDonald's diet. He lost 37 pounds after eating nothing but McDonald's on a calorie restriction. Uh, there's Andrew Taylor, who literally lost 117 pounds, eating nothing but potatoes, which is crazy. But again, all of this on a calorie restriction. Mm. Who knows what a calorie is? Can someone describe a calorie? It's something to do with energy. Absolutely, yeah. A calorie is a unit of energy. Uh, technically, it's the amount of energy needed to heat um, one gram of water. That's what one calorie is. Um, and... Uh, okay, I'm going a bit ahead of myself, but yeah, so I think we can all agree that if we focus on calories, then we can certainly get at least closer to the results that we want. Am I right? Mm. Okay. Yeah. Is it better to burn fat quickly or burn fat slowly? 
There's two. There's two. Um, there's two um, methods. Um, the scientists are, uh, uh, don't agree on this. Mm. Some say. Some say it's um, it's better to burn it quickly because it motivates you. And mm. others say that if you burn it slowly, you, it stays off for you for longer. Mm. Uh, yeah. Okay. Does anyone else, uh, anyone else have anything to say about that? Are you more likely to lose muscle mass if you burn, if you lose a lot quickly? Yep, absolutely. Who said that? Uh, Stephen. Stephen, yep. Okay, so 100%. You're more likely to lose lean mass tissue. Anyone else have anything to say? <laughs> well, I don't want to talk because huh? my voice is going all the time. So I said again? I just didn't. I want to give other people the you lose more water talk. from your lose body. More water. Okay, yep, you tend to lose more water in the beginning. Okay, so I'm going to quickly go ahead and oh, say that. Oh, hmm? go ahead. Okay, so basically, when you lose fat really quickly, we tend to refer to it as um, kind of gearing towards crash dieting. Um, famous examples include juice diet, seven day detox, cabbage soup diet, the carrot juice diet, and the Benavita shake diet. Now, you probably haven't heard of the Benefita Shake Diet, but I used to sell this, and I'm, I'm a bit embarrassed, but I used to sell weight loss products a few years ago, and um, the Benefita was this kind of quote-unquote revolutionary diet that's got doctors worldwide baffled, you know, and it basically focused on losing weight very quickly. And it's not necessarily a bad thing to lose weight very quickly, but as someone said earlier, it's very hard to sustain. Do you remember... How many people are old enough to remember when Oprah Winfrey lost 140, uh, she lost, how much was she? she lost 67 pounds in 1980. Yeah. Do you remember that? Yeah. And yeah. she promoted, uh, yeah. she was working for the OptiFast company. So she basically went on a juice diet, essentially a juice diet, and she lost 67 pounds. And you can see the before and after picture there on the screen. She was very proud of it. And she actually famously dragged on all, um, like what that, that little thing that she's dragging on the stage. That's all the fat that she lost. And mm. she was very happy about it. But later on in an interview, she said that two weeks after I returned to eating real food, at which point I was up 10 pounds. Since I wasn't exercising, there was nothing my body could do about it, but regain the weight. So you're more likely to gain the weight quicker if you lose the weight quicker. This is a, a YouTuber called Catherine, and she went on a crash juice diet consisting of 500 calories a day. And she apparently lost 30 pounds in six weeks, which is pretty impressive. Two months later, she gained all the weight back, and that's the before and after. So on the right, was taken two months after she uh, lost all that weight. Okay, so losing weight quickly, not necessarily the best thing. Okay, and as Stephen said earlier, if you lose weight too quickly, you're more likely to lose muscle mass. Now you can see the screen, right? Mm. Yeah, I, li I like the analogy of the uh, the hare and the tortoise. We all know that story, don't we? The hare and the tortoise. Yeah. Interaction, my friends. <laughs> yeah. Speak back at me. Speak back at me. Yep. So you know the yeah. hare was like, "Oh, I'm so fast, I can beat you at a race." But the hare never finished, reached the finishing line. The tortoise was much slower, and he was able to reach his finishing line mm. eventually. And I'm a big, I'm a big fan of the tortoise. I'm a big fan of losing weight slowly. Not only because you're less likely to lose muscle, but also because if you go to the gym regularly, which is something I'm going to suggest doing later on, you're not going to lose as much strength. Okay, um, your energy levels don't drop as much. Uh, you tend to have more overall energy, um, a smaller drop in metabolic rate. Something I'm going to touch on in a minute. Mm. And ultimately, you know, you've got more sustainable long-term results. Now, even if you lose weight slowly, you are going to hit a weight loss plateau at some point. But it tends to be a bit later on. I'm going to cover weight loss plateaus in around 10 minutes or so. How are you for time, by the way? Is everyone cool? No one has to rush up. Yeah. Okay, cool. Yeah. Any yeah. questions so far? Is this all making sense? Yeah. Huh? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. On, if, you, if there's anything you don't understand, just stop me. I like the analogy of driving a car. You know, um, I'm in Birmingham, and if I want to drive to London, I'm going to go and I'm going to do the right thing and drive 70 miles an hour, right? But Really? I want to drive there really fast. I'm going to go 150 miles an hour and risk crashing my car or get pulled over by the police, right? If you drive really, really, really slowly at 30 miles an hour, it'll take you 10 years to get to London. Am I right? 
So we yeah, want yeah. to go at 70 miles an hour is trying to be the right, the right kind of speed. Now, why am I talking about cars? You like cars? <laughs> no, I hate cars, but I think it's a great analogy because it's the same with uh, weight loss. You can lose weight very quickly, but the quicker you lose the weight, the more likely you have to crash. So the more likely you are to crash. And that's why we refer okay. to it as crash dieting. Yeah. Right? So mm -hmm. if, you, if you lose weight too slowly, then you know what's gonna happen? You'll take forever to see any results. Um, <laughs> can I ask you a question? Yep, yeah, absolutely. As you're talking about cars and speed, Mm. Um, you have to put something into the car to get it to drive, right? Yep. Yes. Fuel. So I'm here unpacking my shopping and I'm thinking, mm. so what do I put in my body then? What kind of actual foods you should be eating mm. to, to help to burn some of that fat away and to, to gain the right color. I'm going to cover that a bit in a bit, but you remember what I said earlier, you have to be in a calorie restriction. That's the number one thing. And I, I will be covering food. I will be covering okay. food in a bit. But um, yeah, so you remember, remember Mark Hobb, he ate nothing but um, sugary foods and lost weight, but he did it on a calorie restriction. So that's, but I'm not, again, I'm not suggesting that you go on and eat nothing but junk food on a calorie restriction, but that's, that's the main thing you have to focus on if you want to actually lose weight. But um, okay. uh, but what I'm talking about here is like losing weight quickly or losing weight slowly. Um, so I use the car analogy to highlight that point. Now I'm going to get a little bit scientific here. Okay, there are um, things called hormones, and hormones uh, is that are actually responsible for burning fat quickly or burning so burning fat or yeah sorry let me say it again burning fat quickly or burning fat slowly really revo uh, revolves around hormones. Now, do you all know what hormones are? Yeah. 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 So you've got the fat burning hormones, testosterone, adrenaline growth hormone, thyroid hormone, and apitonectin. These basically are hormones that help to accelerate the fat burning process. And then you've got fat storing hormones, which are basically hormones which are more responsible for slowing down the fat loss process. Now, insulin, cortisol, estrogen, things like that. And then there's something called leptin. Now, as, again, whenever I do this talk, sometimes I lose people when I talk about the science. So if you don't understand anything, please stop me. Okay. Is that all making sense so far? Yeah. Cool. Okay. So, we, so I'm, I'm going to come back to that in a bit. But would you agree that if calories is the number one factor that you need to focus on, then we should at least have some idea how many calories that we need to maintain our current weight? Would you agree with that? Yeah. Yes. Okay. So if you eat more calories than you burn, what's going to happen to your weight? Gain weight. You'll gain weight. Gain. And if you eat fewer, you'll lose weight. Yeah. Okay. So. Uh, a bit more, a bit more promotion. I cover all this in my book, How to Get the Perfect Body. But anyway, let's continue. We've talked about what calories are. It makes sense, therefore, to find out exactly how many calories we need to maintain our current weight. And there's three ways to do this. There's a really, really accurate way to do it, and this is what the professional bodybuilders do. And then there's an inaccurate way to do it, which relies more on calorie calculators and stuff like that. I'm going to go over this quite quickly because it is a little bit deep, but. The accurate way of tracking your calories is um, by basically using weight scales and MyFitnessPal. So what you want to do is you want to weigh yourself every day at the same time for two weeks. And then you want to calculate using MyFitnessPal or something like that, how many calories you eat every day. And you do that for two weeks. I can tell you right now, I ain't never going to do that. Exactly. You know what? Everybody says that. Everybody says that. It's such a pain in the bum. I, I've, I've done this myself, and it's very, very annoying. It's very frustrating. I mean, you know, you, you, you go to, even if you go to a restaurant and you're going to look at your portion size, you're going to whip out my fitness pal, and it's so annoying. It's so annoying. But if you wanted to do things the most 100% accurate way, the only way that you can really assess your calorie maintenance is by doing this. And I said this for two weeks. Why do I say two weeks instead of one day? Why do I say two weeks? Because you get a true sense of 
of what you really eat. Absolutely. Have you heard of NEAT? Anyone heard of NEAT? Do you know what NEAT is? Are you saying, I don't know what you're saying. NEAT, uh, NEAT N-E-A-T, -N -N -E it's, a, it's a acronym. It's an acronym, no, I don't know what it means. Um, Non-exercise activity thermogenesis. So basically what that means is how much energy we burn when we're not exercising. And it varies. It's impossible to track. Like even if you scratch your head or jump up in the air that you're burning calories. So there's no way yeah. of 100% accurately assessing your calorie expenditure, but we can get a rough idea if we do this particular method. Um, as you said, who said that by the way? Who said you're not gonna do it? Was it Elaine or? Me, yeah. Who was it? It was Elaine. Elaine, yeah, exactly. And I, I totally agree. A lot of people don't like doing this. Um, but again, you know, unfortunately, science doesn't really have any friends. Science, unfortunately, can be a little bit, you know, a pain in the bum. But this is, I'd say this is the most accurate way if you were going to do anything. Um, and what you do is you basically weigh yourself every day, same time, get an average, do the same with the calories, get how many calories you are eating every day for around two weeks. Um, don't cheat. A lot of people cheat when they do this and they always under report. So you have to be hundred percent honest with yourself. If you're eating a cheesecake or two cheesecakes, record that and measure it. And then again, you find the average after two weeks. And that is the most accurate way of assessing how many calories you need to maintain your weight. Now, if you find that your weight is going up, then you know that you're eating too many calories or more than you burn. So ideally your weight should be roughly around the same if you're doing that method. Now, the more popular method is method B where you don't have to do all that two weeks of tracking. We can just kind of get a rough idea how many calories you burn. And we do this by, first of all, weighing yourself in pounds. Okay. So does anyone know how much they weigh? It's none of your business. <laughs> okay. Okay. Fair enough. <laughs> but if you, yeah. if you, if you, if you, if you get, if you get your weight in pounds, again, ideally yeah. do this over a few days, but if you want to do like a rough idea, Weigh yourself in pounds and then yeah. assess your activity levels. So if you don't go to the gym, if you basically don't do anything, any exercise at all, then we have this thing called a body weight multiplier. So sedentary would be 12, um, lightly active, like a, uh, maybe one to two hours of weights or cardio every week or walk around the block every so often. Moderately active would be a regular gym goer three to five times a week. I say most people would be probably between 13 to 15. Okay. And then the very active and extremely active would tend to be like uh, people who are doing it for a living, basically. So I'm going to say like maybe 15. Okay. And then what you do is you multiply your weight in pounds by that activity level. And um, that will give you a rough idea how many calories you burn every day. Is that all making sense so far? Yeah. Yeah. And the least accurate way of doing it would be by doing something called calorie calculators. Now, a lot of people go online and they type in these figures into a calculator and that gives them uh, a result straight away, how many calories they burn every day. Is it accurate or is it not accurate? It's not. Mm. No, it's not accurate at all. No. It's not accurate at all. In fact, it's very inaccurate. But you know, people like quick results and the quicker the result, the more inaccurate it is. The longer it takes to get to um, assessing maintenance calories tends to be the most accurate way of assessing it. Quiz time. Just out of interest, what is the average weight? What is the, uh, what's the question? How much does the average person in the UK weigh? And how many calories do we burn each day on average in this country, UK? Mm. Give up? Yeah, give up. The average man weighs around 13 stone and the average woman weighs around 11 stone. She's around 180 pounds, 155 pounds. Um, and we recommend 2,500 for the average person. But in actual fact, according to Public Health England, 3,200 calories is what the average person, in, the average man in England is consuming, which is why we have a bit of a weight problem, I think, at the moment. Um, a bit like America. America's got a bit of an obesity problem at the moment, doesn't it? Um, the same with women, they tend to eat more calories than what is recommended. Again, there's no such thing as the average person, but I just thought I'd throw that in there. So once you've got your maintenance calories, you want to cut the calories you eat by around 15%. 
Why 15%? Why not 25 or 30%? Why not 30 I should think it's about not being too, too hungry if you reduce yep. too much. Yep. If you, if you, if you, well, it's more about, remember what we said earlier about losing weight quickly versus losing weight slowly? Slowly, yeah. If you, if you, if you cut your calories too much, then your body is going to fight back and you won't burn the calories as quickly. And I'm going to show you examples of that a bit later on. But ideally, we want to cut around 15%. And I'm going to ask you another question. Do you know who this guy is? And what's the relevance? No idea. It's not, it's not a very good quality photo. No, it's a rubbish, uh, a rubbish photo. Uh, I'm going to give you a clue. This was he's taken. an actor. He's a celebrity. Mm -hmm. He is a magician. And this was taken in 2003. I actually found this picture on the internet. And it's the only picture I have, which explains why it's a bad quality. But it is a guy called David Blaine. Now, mm -hmm. do, you remember, do you remember when David yeah. Blaine decided to starve himself for 44 days in 2003? Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Oh, good. Mr. Wan got that. Okay. David Blaine. Yeah. Um, yeah. Now, why do I put that on there? Why am I putting this picture on there? What's the relevance? Is that what he looked like when he afterwards when he started eating again? Nope. So basically, what he did is he basically stayed in a box for forty-four days and lived off nothing but water. And he did that. So he did that for literally forty-four days. And there's a reason I put this on here. Really to highlight a point I made earlier. Is it because you can live without food, but you can't live without water? No, no, no. It's because he was literally not eating anything for 44 days. Can you imagine if he was burning weight or burning fat at the same rate in the first five days as he was in the last like, five days, for example, on his 44th day? If it was burning weight at the same speed as he was in the beginning, then he'd look like a skeleton at the end of it. Am I right? Yeah, but he wasn't yeah. moving. Yeah. No, my point is that the body put the brakes on the fat burning process. So what happens is when you cut your calories too much, what your body does is your body puts the brakes on. A bit like that example I used of driving 150 miles an hour, you will have to put the brakes on at some point. And that's exactly what happened here. So... Basically, he's not eating any food. The body says, uh oh, there's no fuel coming in. We have to slow down the fat burning process in order to preserve energy. And so after 44 days, he still was alive. He wasn't a skeleton. Because if it wasn't for that break, if you like, then he would be a skeleton after 44 days. So the body likes to slow down the fat burning process when you cut calories too much. And that's why I put him on there. And that's why also we don't want to cut calories too much. Is that all making sense? Any questions so far? No, it's making sense. Good, good, good. I'm going to complicate things a little bit more uh, because as I said before, science has no friends. So we're going to talk about something called macronutrients now. Now, who knows what macronutrients are? Me. What's a macronutrient? What are macronutrients? <laughs> Carbs, proteins, and fat. Exactly. Carbs, proteins, fat. And this is where things get more complicated because unfortunately, I wish it was just about calories, but it isn't. And we have to start talking about carbs, proteins, and fats. And I think it was uh, Janet who said, what's the kind of food that we should be eating ideally if we're going to consider dieting? And this is really what you have to focus on now is the macronutrients. So what are carbohydrates and what's the point of eating carbohydrates? What do they do for the body? Source of energy. Exactly. Energy. It's mainly energy. Yeah, it does contribute towards testosterone production, but don't worry about it. The main thing is energy. And we really want to focus on healthy carbs because they tend to contain fiber and they tend to fill us up better. So things like uh, carrots, porridge, but um, to some degree, potato, ideally sweet potatoes, uh, vegetables, yam, things like that. That's where you can get your carbs from. And protein, that's always a, a hotspot in the diet world, is protein. Um, everywhere you look, so protein, there's protein that, protein bars, everywhere you see. Why is why protein so important? Why is it? Why do people keep harping on about it? Help build because muscle. it's slow release. 
Nope. It's slow release energy. No. Nope. Fill it for longer. Yeah, it does, it, does, it, does fill, it does fill you up more. Yep, I agree with you there. But I wouldn't say it's a slow release necessarily. Why, why is protein so important? Would you survive without protein? If you had no protein, would you die or would you survive? You can live without Depends carbs. What type of protein? All proteins, any protein. protein. And Absolutely. But just let's say that you cut protein completely out of your diet. Would you survive or would you die? No, you would die. You'd die, yep, because protein is extremely important. Um, it's used to make hair, skin, nails, cells, hormones, enzymes, antibodies, blood clotting factors. Basically, it's, it's very important to keep you alive. Okay. But when it comes to what we're talking about, protein is very important for muscle growth and muscle, su uh, muscle sustenance. In order to maintain muscle, we need protein. If we don't eat enough protein, we're going to break down more muscle. And we don't want to break down muscle, do we? We want to keep the muscle and lose the fat. Yeah? Yeah. Especially if you're in a calorie yeah. restriction. So you want to make sure you get enough protein. These are animal sources you can get from turkey, basically all animals. If you eat an animal, you'll, you'll get enough protein. Um, obviously, there's vegetarian and vegan sources like uh, lentils, soy, tempeh, beans, quinoa. Uh, chickpeas etc but basically make sure you get enough protein and then there's fat is fat good or fat bad it's good, good and bad it's good and bad exactly that's a great answer it, it yeah, is, it's good and it's also yeah. bad you do need fat to survive um, most people in the developed world tend to eat too much of the horrible fats the trans fats which are um, processed fats and that's not good for you but then there are good fats you can get from, for example, fish, um, you know, cod liver oil. You know, your mum, did your mum ever used to tell you to have your cod liver oil every day? Or was it just my yes. mum? Yeah. <laughs> no, 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 we all have. You've got, got the omega-3s. Yeah, omega-3s. Yeah, omega -3s. Uh, omega -3s are, are tend to be lacking for most diets. Omega-3 is extremely important and it's a component of fats, uh, certain fats. It's, we call it an essential fats. Um, which are basically, you can't synthesize them in the diet. So you so synthesize them in the body. So you have to consume omega-3s from the diet. But my point is that fat is very important, but we don't want to eat too much fat because they're very energy rich. And then they'll be contributing towards your calories. And I'm going to go over that in a minute. And then there's fiber. You know, we all know that fiber is good for you. I'm not going to talk too much about fiber. Mm. Okay. Is this all making sense? Please tell me I haven't lost anybody yet. No, it's my okay, good. I feel like I'm telling a story, and sometimes, you know, so whenever I've done this talk before, I sometimes lose people around this stage. So, if there's anything that you don't understand, please stop me. Um, as a general rule of thumb, for every pound of body weight, we want to consume between 0 0.3 to 0 0.5 grams per pound. So, if you weigh 200 pounds, you want to basically consume, I'd say, 0 0.3 times 200 pounds, which is around 60 grams of fat per day. Um, the same with protein. If you weigh around 200 pounds, you want to consume one gram per pound, which is around 200 grams. Um, fiber is a general rule of thumb, around 30 to 40 grams should be enough for most people. And the remaining calories will come from carbohydrates. Now, this took me a while before I actually understood the relevance of this, but I'm really telling you some golden nuggets here. This is really important stuff. This is what a lot of dieters do not talk about. Do you know why? Just out of interest, do you know why? No one ever talks about this? No. Has anyone ever heard this before? Is this all new to anybody? It's new to me. Okay. Do you know why no one ever did? Because it doesn't sell. It's too complicated. People like to simplify stuff, you know? But when you really break down the actual core of the science, this is really what it comes down to. Okay. So, this again, it's going to be quite complicated. Okay. But, for every gram of, remember we said about earlier about calories. Now it's very important where you get your calories from. So for one gram of carbohydrate it contains four calories and one gram of protein contains four calories. Fat is very energy dense, so it contains nine calories. And so it makes sense therefore, if we can work out uh, macronutrient ratios that will optimize fat burning as well as maintaining muscle maintenance. Or muscle growth yeah yeah so say that again yeah okay 
So let's say, for example, that you want to cut your calories. Okay, let's say that you burn 2,500 calories a day and you want to go on a diet and you want to consume 2,000 calories a day. Now, you can just work out, um, you can have a diet plan where you eat 2,000 calories a day. But if you don't work out where those calories are coming from, then you severely risk losing muscle. And that's something we don't want. So what we need to do is put a ratio to how many, uh, to where the calories are coming from. So you might want to have, for example, um, a certain number of calories coming from protein, a certain number of calories coming from fat, and a certain number of calories coming from carbohydrate. And that cumulative amount of calories will be less than the number of calories that you burn. And that way, not only are you going to lose fat, but you're also going to maintain muscle. And we'll talk about that in a little bit. So there's something interesting I've seen uh, in this, uh, in the previous chart. It, it's it's about alcohol. Um, about it, what? It contains sorry? seven alcohol. Can, oh yeah, alcohol, it's yeah. basically carbs in water, and yet it's just about double the amount of uh, calories in carbs. Does that mean that when you break down carbohydrates, um, the calorie count goes up? Because well, alcohol, alcohol, alcohol is a bit, alcohol is very unique because al alcohol is the only macronutrient that cannot be broken down by the cells of the body. The only place that alcohol can be broken down is the liver. And the reason is because it's actually a toxin. So when you drink alcohol, uh, there's a lot of things that happen. It takes longer to break it down. And when it does get broken down, it's only the liver is, is the only place that can break it down which is why a lot of people who drink a lot of alcohol tend to suffer from liver cirrhosis, you know, basically liver disease. It's a bit different from the other ones, which is why I tend not to talk about it too much. Obviously, I'm not gonna suggest drinking alcohol, but if you are gonna drink alcohol, it's something you've got to be aware of, obviously regarding that. And also it's also calorie rich as well. So, so I'm really kind of focusing mainly on carbs, protein, fat. So where was I? So let's see, let's see. Um, so I'm going to use an example here. So if you if you want to go on a diet and lose burn uh, burn fat, you can work it out by multiplying your maintenance calories by 0.85, which is a 15% reduction. And once you've worked out how many calories that you need to consume every day, then we can uh, further break down where the calories come from regarding fat, uh, protein, and carbs. So if you remember what I said before, 0.3 grams on average times your body weight is going to be the number of uh, the amount of fat that you get from fat. So let's say that again, number of calories that you get from fat. And then if we apply the um, ratio that I mentioned in the previous slide, you times the uh, grams in fat with by nine, and that would give you the number of calories. You want me to go over that again? <laughs> Is there any other way to lose weight? Because I know I'm not going to do this. No, 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 but the, I'm go I am going somewhere with this because it's very important that I say it. There are other ways, of course, there are other ways, but we're looking at, remember what I said earlier, you can lose weight other ways, but we want to maximize how much um, muscle that you have. A lot of people who lose weight lose too much muscle. Um, and I'm, I am going to simplify this a little bit, but basically all diets are variants of this. And this is like the most accurate way of doing it. So we got 0.3 times your weight. So let's say you weigh 200 pounds, you get 60 grams from fat. And then you multiply that by nine. So that would be, that would give you how many calories you need to get from fat. Dietary protein, one gram per pound is usually enough. And the rest can come from carbohydrates. So that's your macronutrient ratio worked out. And adjust your macronutrient. Now, this is where I was saying, who said um, they're not going to do this? Was it Elaine? Yeah. Okay. Now, this is where it gets very interesting because I don't expect people to do that. I don't expect you to walk around with um, my fitness pal and assess how much grams you're eating every day, because that's just not realistic. Mm. What, what I expect is maybe do that for a couple of days. Okay. And then what you can do is you can apply those uh, ratios and those calorie requirements to meal plans. And then you basically eyeball it. Okay. So let's say for argument's sake, you need 2,000 calories a day to lose weight. You can then um, design meal plans whereby the total number of calories would be 2,000. And then you can eat that every single day or variants of that, whereby you're consuming 2,000 calories by meal plans as opposed to whipping out my fitness pal all the time and using that. 
I'm good. Okay, here we go. So I'm going to use, this is the guy I work with, Dave. That's not his real name, but I'm going to call him Dave. Mm -hmm. This is the, yeah, so this is the guy. He's like, I don't like the way I look. I want to lose weight. I want to look great. So this is exactly what we did. We said, okay, let's first of all find out um, what you weigh. He weighed 200 pounds. His maintenance calories was two and a half thousand. And we said, okay, so in order to lose weight, you're gonna have to eat fewer calories. So we multiplied 2,500 by 0.85, so a 15% reduction. And he was on 2,125 calories, which is what he ate every day for a few months. And then from that, can you see the top of the screen? 2,125 calories? Mm -hmm. Okay, so from that, we said, okay, you weigh 200 pounds. We recommend one gram per pound, that's 200 grams. Um, multiply that by four gives you 800 calories because that's four, four calories uh, for one gram of protein. So 800 calories is how much he needed to consume from protein. 0.3 times 260 grams, multiply that by nine, so 540 calories from fat. And the rest came from carbohydrates, which worked out to be 785 calories, 196 grams of carbs. And um, I'm going to show you what he looked like a bit later on in the slideshow, but the results were very impressive. Now, remember what I said earlier, Elaine, about how you can, once you work out how many calories you need, you can then design meal plans, which yeah. will show you uh, the calorie, protein requirements and everything else. This is actually taken from my book, Lean Meals for Everyone. At the bottom of each recipe, I've got your calories, your fat, protein, carbs. So let's say that you need 2,000, then you can look at various recipes. And if it all adds up to 2,000, then that's all you need to do. Okay, quiz time. Oh my God. How many <laughs> calories are in each of these foods? God knows. Have a guess. How many calories is in a Big Mac? Five hundred something. Yeah, six hundred and fifty. How many calories are in five apples? Two hundred and fifty. All these, all these, all these foods have the same number of calories in them. Really? Bloody yep. Oh. <laughs> Four hundred and twenty. Uh, I think. Five hundred. I can't see the last. Oh, five apples. I would say then seven hundred calories. Yeah. Five apples. Yeah. I'm gonna say. Five hundred. Okay, here we go. Five hundred calories. Four hundred, yeah. Wow. <laughs> so there you go. So Big Mac has five hundred calories. There you go. Yeah. Now, we've talked a lot about diets, haven't we? Are there any questions so far? Have I lost anybody so far? No, nope. it's still here. Okay. Yeah. Remember what I said earlier: science has no friends. I wish I could simplify this stuff, but you know, that's just the way it is. So you're losing your fat, that's great. But what about the muscle? We want to keep the muscle, don't we? We don't want to lose the muscle, ideally. Hello, feedback. feedback. Ideally, yeah. 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 True. Okay. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about building muscle or maintaining muscle. What's the big deal about muscle? Well, if you strip all the fat down, what's left behind is going to be the muscle. If you don't have any muscle, then you're going to have that kind of skinny fat slash skinny thin appearance. And again, it's not, most people tend to go for the ideally want the athletic lean physique, uh, which is certainly possible if we kind of apply these principles to your dieting routine. And I'm going to prove that by asking you a very good, a very, very good question here, which is, who is this actor? I want to see if anyone can get it. Oh, that's um, uh, Batman, isn't it? Yep. Christian Bale. Christian Bale, that's Christian Bale, that is. Why did I put this on here? Why did I put this picture on here? Because he looks emaciated. Yep. But why did I put it on there? Why do you think I put it on there? To show that you can lose weight. Yeah. Yep, you can lose weight, but... Is it necessarily the weight you want to lose? No, he's lost no way. He's lost all his muscle. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yep. The world, he lost all of his muscle. Uh, he went on a, there was a film called um, The Machinist, 2004. Pretty good film, actually. And he had to play like this kind of emaciated drug addict. And um, he decided to eat nothing but one apple every day. 
And sometimes he would eat a can of tuna fish, but basically it was an apple every day. And he did that for four months and that's what the result was. Mm. Wow. He lost all his fat, which is great, but he also lost loads of lean tissue and muscle, which is not so great because that's not what we want, is it? We want to keep the muscle and lose the fat. Which is no, but what I'd like is the willpower to be able to, to sustain any kind of healthy uh, eating plan over mm -hmm. that length of time. Because that's what I admire, the fact that he was able to stick to it. Mm. He was probably getting paid about £2 billion to do it, though, wasn't he? Well, he was. But I mean, what, 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 I'm, what I'm trying to say is, 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 is the objective just purely weight loss? Or do you want to have some kind of bulk to it as well, some kind of athletic lean physique? I think you have to lose, if, if, if you're really overweight, you, you're really going to have to lose the weight fast, uh, lose the fat fast, so it's easier for your muscle to actually um, put, put itself through the pressure. Otherwise, you could do yourself some damage. Mm. I think it'll be a sort of com combination of approach, though, isn't it? Lose lose fat quick, and then start um, um, build, working up your muscle. Mm. Mm. Actually, good question. What do you yeah. lose first, um, the fat or the muscle, or both of them together? Mm. So I said that again. Do you lose first um, the fat or the muscle, or both of them at the same time? Yeah, good question. It depends on how fat you are. So the fatter you are, there's something called uh, nutrient or calorie partitioning. So, um, and I think I highlighted this a bit earlier about um, the differences between losing fat quickly and losing fat slowly. If you have, let's say that you have loads and loads of fat, but you don't have a lot of muscle, then it can be more advantageous, as the world said, to lose the fat quicker because you've got less muscle to lose. Whereas let's say that um, you've got already quite a lot of muscle but you're also obese as well. So you've got a bit of fat. We've got quite a lot of fat over that muscle. Mm. Then it's better to lose the weight slower because then you can minimize how much fat, how much muscle you lose. So, if yeah. very, and, and that's something called calorie partitioning because if you are very obese, then every time you eat, those calories tend to go more towards the fat. Whereas if you're already relatively, you know, say 15% body fat, then every time you eat, the, the calories are more likely to go towards the muscle. And again, this is kind of why I mentioned about the protein a bit earlier is that if you are quite muscular, but you also have a lot of fat, then it's really important that you get your proteins up because you don't want to, if you have not enough protein in your diet at the same time, you are going to lose a lot more muscle than if you didn't. So those protein ratios are very important. It all making sense. Any, anything that doesn't make any sense. That's Christian Bale a year later, by the way, in um, Batman wow. Begins. Now you see the difference Amazing. there? Yeah. Now, he, he was interviewed, and in an interview, he said, after filming The Machinist, I lost so much muscle that I could barely do a press-up. It took many, many months of very intense weight training to get the muscle back. So, mm -hmm. you can see, some, this, this is kind of what I think most people would prefer, this kind of look, than the emaciated look. Am I right? Yeah, I agree. Yeah. That's why we can't neglect muscle. A lot of people do when they go on diets. They don't really care about muscle, but then they don't get the results they really want. So, we've got to bear that in mind. Um, and this kind of goes back to the original question. Um, should we be dieting? Yes, if you're above 18% body fat, 23% for women. Should you be bulking? What do I mean by bulking? What is bulking? It's eating more calories than you burn. Yep, eating more calories than you burn. But we, what, why, why do you want to do that? To increase muscle mass. Increase yeah. muscle mass, exactly. So there's two there's actually a very very um good study by a lady called Varadi or something but I can't remember her name Vidati or something um but she did a study whereby she looked at a lot of dieters and she analyzed their muscle mass during the dieting process by something called DXA which is like a dual x-ray optometry which is basically a way of assessing body fat and um, muscle ratios and what she found is that the average dieter loses up to 30 percent of their muscle whilst they diet 30 percent that's a lot Should i say that again 30 percent that's you a mean, lot you, you, you can lose up to 30 percent if you don't do the right things if you don't eat enough protein if you don't work out mm. the right way so this, this is why it's really important to focus on muscle and you see where i'm going with this can't you you see where i'm going with this yeah 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 i'm, I'm going to be talking about Ooh. exercise <laughs> okay so um, we've already touched on macronutrients. One gram per pound protein is, is pretty much recommended for most people, whether they're dieting or not. 
who knows what testosterone is and what's the relevance of testosterone? Yeah, it's a hormone that is used to um, stimulate muscle growth. Yep. And I've got no, all the, I've got all the, only, can you see the screen, mate? Not only that, not, no? not only that guys, I want to say that the testosterone is extremely important for libido and many other very important things. Absolutely. Yeah. And clarity of mind. Absolutely. Yep. So I've, I've kind of listed libido is a big one. Okay. Because, and I found this with one of my clients 10 years ago, so he, he basically was dieting for the best part of around three months. And uh, he wasn't eating enough protein, he wasn't training, and his testosterone levels went really low. And he, he had no libido, he had no sexual drive, he couldn't satisfy his partner, but I don't go into too much detail there, but you get what I'm trying to say. So his testosterone levels were very, very low. So was it, was it uh, Mr. Wan, did you say that just now? I, I don't know who said that. I, uh... My yeah. name is Maru, yeah, yeah. Oh, Maru, sorry, sorry, mate, Maru. So, yeah, um, <laughs> you're 100% right. It, it's all about not only muscle growth and not only feeling great and feeling strong and everything else, but also libido as well. Libido is a big one. So we have to focus on that too. And I've listed, and if you look at the, at the list, ways that you can boost your testosterone, uh, resistance training, weight training, ideally, sleep. There was a study. Uh, carried out in 2018 where they looked at um, two groups of dieters one group was sleep deprived five hours of sleep every day and the other group was um, getting around seven to eight hours of um, sleep every day they're both dieting but the Wait. sleep deprived group lost a lot more muscle than the non-sleep deprived one and also their testosterone levels were much slower and i'm going to go into it's that a little bit five later. hours is five hours sleep deprived for this particular group now this is this is where it gets a bit interesting they say that five hours uh for the um for average is is a little bit on the low side but some people can get away like with much. it four, four hours four hours of sleep deprived uh, when i say sleep deprived i'm talking about you can you can function on it but it's not ideal for testosterone levels and and um, i'm going to talk about that in a little bit actually so we, really we want something like six to eight hours ideally five hours yeah. some people can get away with it but ideally six to eight hours based on the research as you get older we go through something called sarcopenia who knows what sarcopenia is no basically we naturally lose muscle over the age of 30 and it's more exaggerated over the age of 40 and that's related to testosterone so they say that testosterone levels drop over the age of 30 by one percent each year so how many people are over 40? How many men are over 40? How many men are over 40? Yeah. Me. Okay. So do you find that it's harder to sustain muscle now than it was when you were 18? Yeah, definitely. Yeah. And that's part of the reason why, because we produce less testosterone naturally. The good news is we can do something about it, can't we? We can go to the gym, lift weights, sleep longer. I'll talk about that uh, in around 10 minutes, but there are things you can do to boost up your testosterone levels. I touched on earlier about sleep. Sleep is important for optimizing muscle growth and brain function. Basically, everything you do, you do less well, the less you sleep. So sleep is important for everything. If you have seven to eight hours of sleep, you produce more testosterone, less cortisol, more growth hormone, which again is synonymous with muscle growth. Who knows what ghrelin is? Hunger hormone. Yeah, exactly. Hunger hormone. So the more ghrelin you have, the more hungry you get. So yeah, so so basically it's, it's quite interesting that the longer you sleep on a regular basis, and I have to repeat regular basis, not just a one-off, the more ghrelin you... So, so, so basically you don't have these crazy, bizarre hunger pangs and the cravings the more you sleep uh, to some degree. If you sleep over eight hours, they say that those hunger pangs can be more accentuated. But you roughly want six to eight hours is basically it. Calorie surplus. Now, um, I think it was Elaine that said that we want to be on a calorie surplus, ideally, if you want to gain muscle. Was it you, Elaine? Somebody said that. You do want to ideally be on a calorie surplus. So I get, I get uh, some people who are very thin and they want to gain muscle. And they do have to eat more than they burn. And there's something called mTOR. Who's heard of mTOR? You can't have muscle growth over mTOR. And mTOR requires a calorie surplus in order to gain muscle. There are exceptions like newbies and stuff like that, but basically for the average person, um, if they wanna grow muscle, 
they do need a slight calorie surplus and that's where the bulking comes from so really we're looking at that's why i said earlier you if, if you're below a certain body fat percentage then it's okay to focus on bulking because you are inevitably going to get a little bit of fat because you are going to be consuming more calories than you burn but the upside of that is that you're also going to be putting down some solid muscle as well and then when you cut or cut your calories you can strip off that fat and expose that newly grown muscle and that's what that's what most fitness professionals do and exercise of course is extremely important why is exercise important there's this guy called kenneth cooper who said we do not stop exercising because we grow old we grow old because we stop exercising exercise keeps us young um, especially, Sorry, especially resistance training so resistance training is extremely key and I, i've been saying this for the best part of 15 years and it's only recently more people are starting to say oh maybe we should do resistance training yeah because all the evidence says that's the best way you can actually uh, live a long healthy life i'm gonna say a few words about micronutrients who knows what micronutrients are but we all know what yeah, micronutrients are now Yeah, the composition, uh, the, what make up the macronutrients? Macronutrients is basically the food we eat. So 95% of the food we eat are macronutrients, carbs, proteins, and fat. Micronutrients are vitamins and minerals. I would suggest having a, uh, if your diet's not great, then there's no harm having a multivitamin every day. Okay. But if you're eating lots of fruits and vegetables, ideally green vegetables, you'll probably get enough vitamins and minerals from that. Okay, but I don't really want to talk too much about micronutrients at the moment because. Now, do you remember Dave? Remember Dave? Who remembers Dave? I remember him, but I didn't watch. I didn't watch the slide with his uh, his calorie yeah. audit when he did. Uh, you know, when he counted how many calories he needs to okay. maintain his weight. Uh, but okay, I remember okay. him. Yeah. So we said fifteen percent calorie deficit. Okay. Um, now, this is someone who uh, was going to the gym, I'd say probably three times a week, but he wasn't really, he didn't really have a, a program in, in, in place. So we put a program in place for him, uh, mainly a weight training program. We adjusted his macronutrient ratios. So he was a one gram per pound body, uh, protein, 0.3 grams per pound fat. All the rest of the calories came from carbs, but it, ultimately the cumulative amount was at a 15% calorie deficit. He was already sleeping quite a lot, but, you know, uh, we made a note, seven to eight hours of sleep a night. And um, he maintained the weight training regime three to four times a week and um, around two rest days. So mainly the weekend he would rest. OK, and that's like what we kind of covered a bit earlier. Am I right? Do you remember that? We kind of covered that in a bit more detail. Yeah. Yeah. So. He weighed 200 pounds. He was having 2,500 calories. I don't, on a restriction, it was 2,125 calories. Oh, oh yeah, I'll show you this. I'll wait. So 800 calories from uh, protein, 540 calories from fat, 196 calories from carbs. And that cumulative amount of calories was a 15% reduction. There you go. Look at him 10 months later. Isn't that pretty That's impressive? Amazing. It's amazing, yeah. isn't it? Yeah. And that's the kind of result I think most people would like. You know what I mean? So you just got to apply the science and keep consistent with it. And of course, buy my book. So there you go. If you're interested in learning more about muscle growth and fat loss, I've written six books. So I've only got four here, but I've actually written six. Uh, check out leangains.co.uk and that's it. Um, now we're going to have a little break. We've been talking for a long time, but we've actually nearing the end of this. Uh, I'd say we've got probably another 15 minutes or so. Uh, is that sound good with everyone? Yeah, good. Man. Yeah. Do you want to break yeah. or should we just work through it? It's up to you. Oh, let's work through, man. Yeah, Go work through. It. I don't mind. Yeah. Okay. Mind. Cool. Any any questions, by the way? Shoot. Any questions? Any questions whatsoever before we continue? So, so really, all, all, it's just about maintenance, though, isn't it? Because as soon as you you break maintenance the, of what though? Maintenance of what? Maintenance of 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 exercise of diet. Because as soon as you go back to the bad ways, you're just gonna, it's just gonna, um, you're gonna lose muscle mass and increase body fat. So it's, yeah. it's really, it's about willpower, really, isn't it? Really, at the end of the day, it's just all about willpower. In part, yes. But what happens if you hit a weight loss plateau? Because no matter what diet you're on, no matter 
even if you drop your calories slowly, at some point you're going to hit a weight loss plateau. You're going to find it harder to burn as many calories as you did in the beginning of the diet. So what happens yeah, then? Yeah, yeah. What, what do you do then? You, you, up, yeah, you, you, you try and increase your metabolism by doing more. Um, How do you increase your metabolism if you're already training, let's say three, four times a week and you're dieting? How would you increase your diet, your metabolism at that point? Um, I would eat, eat, drink the right, eat, eat, drink lots of water, mm -hmm. eat the right foods, mm -hmm. um, all the foods that are involved in increasing metabolism. Okay, so let's um, say that you drink loads of water, but you're still not losing weight as quickly as you used to. What do you do then? Um, in, reduce your calories even further. Okay, and let's say you, you reduce your calories further, but you still find that it's not working and you're starving yourself now and you're going through real hunger pangs and you're starting to feel really ill. Then what do you do? No idea. Okay, so what we do is we, every so often, we're going to have to do a diet break. And yeah. the, anal the analogy I use is a bit like, have you ever, you know, when, when you're studying for an exam or, or you, you, you know, when you're, we've all been students, right? And you can't study all the time without taking a break, you know? Or um, if you're working at work, you need that weekend off, don't you? Or you need to go on holiday every so often, otherwise you go crazy. So we, all, we always need a break and dieting is no different because dieting, essentially you're stressing the body out, whether it's slowly or, or, or over a short time period. So we do need a break. And when I say a break, I mean, going back to maintenance calories for around two weeks. I, there is a slide I'm going to put on a bit later on, which will highlight that. But basically when you do a diet break for, let's say two weeks, and you go back to eating the way you used to eat for around two weeks, what happens to your metabolism? It throws it into flux. It boosts up your metabolism. Remember, we had a fuel shortage a couple of weeks ago. Remember that? We had a fuel shortage. And I remember it was a Saturday night and my fuel gorge was uh, on the red. And I didn't know where I was going to get fuel from because all the petrol stations were closed. Yeah, remember that? Mm -hmm. So I was driving really, really slowly because I wanted to conserve all my energy. I wanted to conserve all my fuel. The moment I filled up my tank, I was driving fast again, yeah? It's the same thing happens with the body. After a while of dieting, your metabolic rate goes down. You start to burn fat much slower. Leptin is like a fuel gorge, okay? When it's sensing that there's not much energy coming in or there's not much yeah. food coming in, leptin says, hold up, we're entering starvation mode. We better burn fat slower. Those fat burning hormones go on the, on the low down and the fat storing hormones go on the high. So you don't burn fat as quickly. So what we have to do is boost the leptin back to normal. And we do that by refeeding. Hence, they call it meal refeed, or some people call it cheat meals. Mm -hmm. And if you do that for, they say new research in the last three or four years said that if you do like a two week diet break, uh, whereby you eat normally again, and then go back to dieting afterwards, you tend to not only sustain the diet long-term, but you also burn more calories in the long-term as well than if you were to const constantly diet over a long time period. So that's the best way of breaking through weight loss patterns. Does mm. that make sense? Yeah. Question. Oh, yep. oh I didn't oh, so hmm? I have a question. So yep. you said when you reach a plateau, mm. you have to go back to maintenance. But in my head, if you reach a plateau, the calories you're eating right now are kind of your new maintenance. So how do you know what is your calories you need to eat? Well, that's why we have to assess the maintenance calories. Remember I said that in the beginning? So if you, if you assess the maintenance calories in the beginning, let's say that you work out in your, through those calculations I mentioned, you work out that you burn, let's say 2,500 calories. In other words, let's say you need 2,500 calories to maintain your current weight. And then you decide to diet to 2,000 calories, for example, and you keep up that 2,000 calories for, let's say, eight weeks. And then at the end of the eight weeks, you're not burning fat as quickly as you did in the beginning. Then you can go back to the 2,500 for a couple of weeks and then go back to 2000. Now, in the long term, you know what's going to happen? You're going to have a new, as you, as you correctly said, you'll have a new maintenance yes. calorie. Okay, after yeah, a period of, let's say, six months or so, you you, you will naturally be uh, have a new maintenance calorie because you would have lost quite a lot of weight by then. But in the earlier but you gain phase, weight back then. When hmm? you go back to maintenance during those two weeks, you're going to gain a few... No, you won't. 
you 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 you'll get why not? Uh, you you you. What will happen is that you'll gain weight in the short term. Yes, that is true. But sometimes mm -hmm. you have to take two steps forward, three steps back. No, two yeah, two steps back, yeah. three steps forward. And I, I think it's a bit like you know, like when you're studying for an exam, um, and you, you you have to take a break, otherwise you can't maintain that concentration level. Yeah. But mm -hmm. during that break time, you're not learning anything new. Does it make sense? Yeah. So sometimes you have to take two steps back in order to go three steps forward. And that's how we uh, diet breaks tend to work. So you're not going to lose weight during a diet break, but your metabolic rate will go up. And then you start burning weight, burn, burning fat. Once you end the diet break and go back to your dieting, mm -hmm. you'll burn more calories than you did before. Yeah. Okay. yeah. And I know okay. that, think of the fuel analogy that I mentioned. That's the best way of explaining it. Um, let's continue, shall we? So a quick reminder to burn fat whilst maintaining or growing muscle, uh, which you can't grow muscle that really when you burn fat, but we'll talk about that later. But in order to maintain at least muscle and burn fat, you need to maintain a, a, a relatively conservative calorie deficit of around 15%. Consume enough protein, one gram pound, um, around 20% uh, should come from fat, 30 to 20%, sorry, 20, uh, 15 to 20%. And uh, the rest comes from carbs. Um, and then we're going to talk about exercise. So this part of the talk is more about exercise now. What happens when you lose weight? Essentially, the brain is saying, I know we need energy for survival. I get it. So by all means, keep breaking down the fat. But for the love of God, don't break down the muscle for energy. He's still using it. <laughs> so, he's still, so when you start lifting weights and everything else, you know, it's like the body is saying, okay, we better hold on to the, um, the muscle because he's weight training, he's, he's exercising. So we want to hold on to that muscle. Remember that study I mentioned earlier about if you don't have enough protein and you don't exercise, you're more likely to burn, burn muscle mass, lean tissue. Uh, so that, that, that kind of highlights that point. So the good thing about exercise is that it not only makes you look better but it's great for heart and cardiovascular health it's great for brain function mood uh, you're probably going to live much longer there's some evidence to show that it actually reduces the aging process um, increases blood flow which again is good for healing and recovery and all that kind of thing so it's got lots and lots of um, benefits now what type of exercise should you be doing do you need do you need a bit of everything Yep, you do. You do. Wait, wait, training. Hmm. Hmm. Wait, training. I okay. Mean, so, yeah. what, what's what's I what's agree. your what's your goal? What's your goal? What what do you want to achieve? Do you want to just muscle. be healthy, or do you want to actually look more athletic? Athletic. Athletic. Yeah. So you want to have more like that visual, sexy look. Yeah. <laughs> When you take your top that's off and look in the one. mirror, you're like, yeah, yeah, man. You know, that's yeah, the that's the one. <laughs> okay, so so you're more likely to get that when it comes to exercise abs. if you're doing uh, what we call resistance training and HIT. okay? Now, don't get me wrong. I'm not saying that you shouldn't do low-intensity exercises because that's very important for uh, fitness and cardiovascular health and everything else, uh, and also blood flow. But if you can focus more on the HIT, those more intense exercises, you know what HIT is, don't you? High intensity interval training. Weight training, essentially, um, short bursts of powerful exercises like sprinting or maybe things yeah. like football, that kind of thing, where you actually, there's bursts of energy. Yeah. Now, you think of muscle fibers as like almost like the DNA of the muscle. So when we do things like walking or, in fact, I'm going to put the next slide up, it makes more sense. So when you do things like walking or endurance training, like uh, marathon running and things like that, you're stimulating what we call type one slow twitch red muscle. Okay. That, which is a fancy way of saying that you're going to get more fit, but the muscles won't grow as much in size. Okay. If you want the muscles to grow in size, then you're going to be focusing more on the type 2A, type 2B muscle fibers, which are associated with weight training, essentially and um, sprinting and things like that. So I use these examples on the left. Can you see the pictures? Yeah, can you see that? Yeah. These are kind of extreme examples. Now, the, can you see the lady on the left? She's a marathon runner. Mm. Yeah, she's doing a lot of endurance training. So that's the kind of appearance that she's gonna have, relatively a, a lean but 
thinnish kind of look. Have you you've seen marathon runners? They tend not to look very bulky, do they? You know, long distance runners. Then you've got someone like Bolt, who's uh, doing that kind of weight training and sprinting. And these are, all, these are kind of extreme examples. Obviously, in the real world, you end up growing all three, but um, he would tend to have a lot more of the type 2A, type 2B muscles. And before you say anything, I know that there's genetics. I know genetics plays a role. And then you've got the type 2B, which is more associated with uh, bodybuilders and the powerlifters. Okay. So uh, type 2A responds more to weight training with medium to heavy weights and sprinting uh, hit exercises like that. Type 2B responds more to heavy weight training and is more associated with powerlifters and bodybuilders. And they tend to grow really big in size, but um, they don't have as much blood going through them, which is why they, uh, if you see a really big bodybuilder, they tend not to have a lot of endurance, you know what I mean? It's the opposite of a type one, like a marathon runner won't be able to lift 400 kg or something, you know what I mean? So ideally, yes, you do want to focus on all three, but I'd say focus more type 2A, type 2B. It's, well, so really where I'm, going, where, I'm, where I'm going with this is that we want to do weight training, basically. You want to integrate weight training into your exercise regime. Um, I've actually written a book about that. I'm going to sell, sell myself a little bit now, but I've actually written a book uh, called The Pocketbook Guide to the Ultimate Gym Workout. Uh, you can put it in your pocket and it will show you everything you need to know, whether you're a beginner, whether you're a man, you're with your woman, whether you're training three times a day, uh, three times a week or five times a week. It's all covered. Great exercises, blah, blah, blah. So check it out. Um, who knows what progressive overload is? Yeah. It's progressive increasing. overload. The muscle, the muscle growth. How do, how do you grow muscle? Let me ask you this. How do you grow muscle? How does muscle grow? Break, then rebuild. Yep, break and rebuild. What happens if you just keep lifting the same weight all the time? You keep lifting 20 kg all the time for six months. Will your muscle keep growing or will it stop growing? It'll stop growing. Why is There's that? No, no, because you're not... Um, challenging yourself exactly so what you've got to really remember if, if you don't remember anything from today remember that the body is adaptive the body responds to change so if mm -hmm. you're going to keep doing the same thing all the time the body says i've been there done that i don't care whereas if you keep increasing the either the reps or increase the weight then your muscle will respond especially when it comes to heavy weights the muscle will respond by getting bigger. Those type 2A, type 2B muscle fibers will be more stimulated. So um, that's when people talk about, you know, rep ranges and set ranges. It really revolves around what kind of fibers you want to stimulate. Uh, so it all revolves around progressive overload. You want to lift heavier or at least do more reps as time goes on, mm -hmm. okay? Yeah. Um, cellular fatigue, who's heard of time under tension? You know what time under tension is? No. Yeah, I know. It, it, uh, somebody taught me this in the gym years ago. He told me you'd get a lot more from doing the, the same exercise if you keep your muscles under tension for as long as you can. Don't do the lift quickly. Do it as slowly as you can. And you, you don't need 12 then. You wouldn't need five. Exactly. You'll be exhausted, but it would be better. Yeah. And that, yeah, that's on the eccentric. So basically, like, as, like if you do a barbell curl, you can do the first part, lifting the barbell up. Um, relatively quicker than releasing it. So as you're doing the downward movement, you do it really slowly. And the theory is that you kind of damage the muscle more. And um, as I said before, the body responds to change. So if you're going to be damaging that muscle more through cellular fatigue or time under tension, then you will stimulate regrowth. And that is very true. So basically you can grow muscle through progressive tension overload and through time under tension or cellular fatigue. Which one's better? Time on attention or progressive overload? Or both? If I can take it, take both, but I think on attention is better. It depends. Yeah. It depends. Mm. It depends. I think they both are very good. And again, you know, if you if you if your aim is so there was a big there was a really big study yes. and you looked at um, people who were doing high reps um, on the time on attention, so they were doing much longer reps, so maybe uh, four or five second reps, um, but they're doing loads and loads of um, uh, loads of reps. Like they were doing like 12 reps in a set uh, and each rep lasted something like four or five seconds. And then they looked at another group of people who were lifting really heavy weights um, and every single time they were uh, training, they would increase the weight. 
So they weren't really focusing on time and attention, but they were focusing on progressive overload. The results were the same. There was still um, just amount of muscle growth, but the difference was that the progressive overload group was actually stronger as well as physically bigger. Okay, and this is obviously you know diet and everything else was was the same for both groups. So it kind of gave us an idea that yes, you can get muscle growth in both ways, but you tend to get an increase in strength uh, during the progressive overload. So some people say progressive overload is actually better. Um, but I think you should do both. I think progressive overload and time on attention. Is, it, is that making sense? Yeah. A no. lot of sense. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I now. I some mm. Mm -hmm. This is going to make sense, but I did see some people sort of go straight into a heavy, mm. you know, when they like training quite heavy mm. and they go sort of straight into it and, I think everyone has that own sort of way of doing it, I guess. Are you, are you talking about like if they, if once once they warmed up, you mean? Most, oh, well, I don't know. Sometimes they just go straight into it, but. You don't want to go yeah. straight into heavy. You don't, you don't want to just like walk into a gym and start lifting heavy. You're going to damage yourself because your muscles yeah. are cold. I'm, I know so, I've seen that as well. I yeah, I mean, I, it's happened to me as well. Believe me, I've, I've damaged everything through experience. So I used to do that, especially when I was younger. I just go into the gym and lift heavy, heavy, like, I'll just go on the heaviest <laughs> one rep max you know from scratch and and you know because your muscles are cold when you go into a gym your muscles are, so you need to warm them up um mm. do maybe a, maybe two three minutes of light jogging or anything really just to warm up mm. and then you can start off with a really lightweight and then you can do your working sets if you do your working sets you can uh, certainly build up to a heavy and then do three sets of heavy mm. and if you are going to do that then that's cool you can finish off with some lighter weights and then embrace the time of the tension then. So you can do a progressive overload time of the tension in one gym session. That's one thing you can do. Or you can break it up, do a heavy day and then do a light day. next. You know, There's different ways of doing it. There's no necessarily right or wrong. But um, mm. understanding the principles behind it, that's the most important thing here. Do you need to eat more than you burn or to grow muscle? Yes, but there are exceptions. Now, can anyone tell me what the exceptions are? If you are overweight already. Yep, obese. Yep. If you got a condition like diabetes or anything like that, you got to be really careful. Um, but can you, I think, I think what I'm saying is, can you build muscle and lose fat at the same time? Yeah. You can, yeah. The, it happened to me. I don't know. It's not a scientific fact, but it's just one example. I said it's not a, a scientific fact. It's just one example. Yeah, it happened to me. I, that's what happened. Um, the more I worked out, the more fat I lost because um, my metabolism got more active. And but can you actually, okay. uh, I should rephrase it. Can you grow new muscle? Like, can you actually bulk up and gain new muscle at the same time as burning fat? Yes. There are, there are, there are times when that can happen. Generally speaking, uh, for, for a lot of people, it's very it's almost impossible to build significant amounts of new muscle at the same time as burning fat. But there are some exceptions. It depends on the type of exercise you do. It depends on whether you're a beginner or not. Okay. Do you remember what I said earlier about how when I was training, um, I, I didn't really know what I was doing, but I was able to lose loads of fat and build muscle. I didn't really know what I was doing, but it only worked for around a year. And then after that, I just started to get fatter and fatter. Yeah, you know, because I was a newbie. There's something that uh, bodybuilders refer to as a honey honeymoon phase. So for the first six months to a year, if you're not really used to training, uh, then basically anything you do will result in muscle growth because it's going to be new to the body. And at the same time, if you decide to cut your calories, you'll still grow muscle uh, for around six months to a year. And then after that, it's harder to sustain muscle growth. So that's when you have to start upping your calories a little bit. So beginners, as uh, as you said earlier, obese individuals, the people who are quite naturally quite fat, they can use all that energy to grow muscle. Um, again, you know, we, that's, that's something to do with um, calorie or nutrient partitioning. So something I touched on a bit earlier. Steroid users, obviously, <laughs> but we're not going to talk about that. And then there's detrained individuals. And we can all relate to this because there was a lockdown for a year, wasn't there? Yeah. Yeah. yeah this is something i can personally relate to this because i was not able to go to the gym for the best part of a year and out of frustration i built a gym in my back garden because i'm thinking if there's another lockdown i don't want to go through that again but i lost loads of muscle okay loads of muscle loads of strength 
I didn't train for the best part of however long the lockdown was, seven months. Uh, so when I went to the gym again, I was on a calorie restriction, but I was still able to build that muscle back because I already had that muscle memory. And so I was growing muscle at the same time as burning fat. Okay. So I was a detrained individual. And that, then there's carb cycling, which you may or may not have heard of carbohydrate cycling or uh, calorie cycling. Yeah. Yeah. It's, uh, forget about that. That's, that's, it's not really worth it because, um, yes, you can grow muscle and lose fat, but it's very slow. Uh, you're better off either focusing on dieting and sticking to it and then focusing on bulk and sticking. You get, I think, quicker results doing it that way. So, yeah, is it all making sense? Yeah. Any questions? Any questions? We're coming towards the end now. <laughs> yes, Hello. I have a question. Sorry. Yeah. Sorry, I think someone was speaking at the same time. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, what's the question? Who, who am I talking to? So, who is this? M. That's my name in the... In oh, the M. Room. Okay. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so my question is, when you're bulking yeah. and you reach a point where you're not gaining that much muscle, you're more gaining fat more than anything, how do you break through? Because we were talking about weight loss. I'm not really interested in weight loss, but I wanted to know when you reach the plateau. But in the opposite, when you're bulking and you reach that plateau, when you eat a lot of calories, you're not seeing muscles you feel like you're getting more fat than anything else what do you do then so you want to look, look if you look at the screen um you want to basically go through phases of okay there's two there's two ways that you can approach this first of all when you say too many calories we as a general rule of thumb you want to go 10 percent above maintenance okay what a lot of people do when they bulk is they eat too much and then they end up gaining all this fat so uh if you had to put a figure to it 10 percent above maintenance is enough for optimal muscle growth and minimal fat growth, okay? So if you are going above 10%, then you're probably gonna gain muscle and loads of fat as well, okay? Yeah. So that's one thing. Um, the other thing, as I said, with the rest, you need to have rest. You need to have detraining, uh, what's it called? Deload week, sorry, deload week. So yeah. let's say that you're doing, um, have you had a periodization, have you heard of that? Does that sound familiar? Is that like a training cycle and then you start? Yeah, it's a training again. cycle. So let's yeah, say yeah, that yeah. you do let's say that you're doing a few weeks of progressive overload. Let's say eight weeks and you, you're lifting heavier and you and you're consistent, your muscle will eventually you, you, your body's gonna break down. You produce too much cortisol and you're not gonna really feel the effects. At that point, mm -hmm. you wanna take a break for two weeks or may, uh, at least one week and and um and take some time off the gym, just recover, and then you can start again. And you'll be able to, ideally two weeks, I would say, but you can do one week. Um, and then when you start again, you'll be able to lift heavier and heavier. You can't do that forever, of course, but you will find that if you do that, use that approach, you'll get some really good results. Um, so, and the other thing I remember is that bulking actually takes longer than cutting. So it can take up to a year to get really good results, especially if you're um, an intermediate trainer. If you're quite new to the gym, you can build quite a lot of muscle in your first year have you heard that before yeah yeah you can build as i think you can gain up to two pounds a month of, of new muscle as a beginner after the first two or three years it, it's more like one pound half a pound you know did i say 10 pounds what did i say ten, what did i just say did i say 10 pounds one pound half a pound no you said two pounds two pounds a month oh, yeah. so you can go around two, two pounds a month um for your first year as a man as a woman, one pound a month, mm -hmm. as a newbie, okay? And this is when you're applying progressive overload, a really good training program and everything else. Now, after your first couple of years, one to two years, that muscle, the new muscle that you gain is not going to be as much, okay? Mm -hmm. um, have you heard of Michael Matthews? Yeah. Oh, sorry. Yeah, he did, a, he did a bestseller called Bigger, Leaner, Stronger. Oh, yeah. Bigger, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. And he talks about that all the time. So he says that there's three years where you can maximize muscle growth. Okay, mm. and this is all, all based on work by a guy called Lyle McDonald. You can Google him if you want. He did, he, he studied all this in, in quite a lot of detail. And um, he said that basically, after three years of doing everything the right way, you're probably going to struggle to gain any more muscle after mm. that, unless you take steroids, of course. You know? So you've got that three years of really maximizing muscle growth. I don't know if that's any good. That's if you do everything like properly to the book kind of thing. How often should you deload? Hmm? Deload uh, on, on, on average every eight weeks. 
oh, on average. Okay. Right, I'm going to show you a picture if I can find it off. Um, so that's Michael Matthews. Yeah. Can you see that? Yeah. So it, for basically for the first eight years of his life, he was training and he wasn't getting, he was basically going through the same thing I was going through, just messing around, not really getting results. And then from his eighth year to the 11th year, you can see the difference there, right? Big difference. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Because during those last three years, he basically figured out how to do things properly. Um, everything I talked about is basically what he did, uh, which is a 10% increased calorie, progressive overload, deloads, um, cutting, and, uh, cutting and bulking. And so not, not, not getting to the stage where you have so much body fat because you're bulking and then think, okay, now I'm going to cut. You, you want to really have that cutoff point of maybe 18% body fat. Okay, now it's time to cut. And then you cut, diet, and then go back to the bulking phase. So it's bulking and cutting, bulking and cutting. And um, it took him around three years to make that dramatic difference. So you really want to go through repeated phases of bulking and cutting during regular weight training sessions. And that will get you the athletic physique that you've been craving for. Now, do you remember I said earlier about weight loss battles? You can, you can screenshot that if you want. That's a general rule of thumb, how often you should take your diet phase. So if you're looking at losing weight, uh, you want to basically do a diet uh, break or, or maintenance break, which is the same as a diet break. Uh, every, every 12 to 16 weeks, if you're over 20% body fat, this is for men, okay? A bit, bit higher for women. Um, if you're more on the lean side, then you want to do uh, diet breaks every four to eight weeks. Okay. That's to maximize your metabolic rate and fat loss at the same time. So um, I'm just going to summarize it all. Uh, you can screenshot this if you like. When you start your muscle growth slash fat loss journey, the first thing you want to do is calculate your maintenance calories. And then you want to focus on either building muscle, which is, um, as I said before, calorie surplus 10%, calorie deficit 15%. Uh, then you want to look at your macronutrients roughly 0.3 to 0.5 grams per pound of fat uh, is what you want to be eating dietary fat and then one gram per pound dietary protein every day you want to do i didn't really say much about cardio did i is anyone still here is he all sleeping <laughs> no i i, I uh, yeah. so no, no, um, no. i didn't i didn't I, I intentionally did not talk too much about cardio because i'm going to do i'm going to do another talk about that but as a general rule of thumb if you're going to be doing regular weight training sessions, then you don't want to do more than two days a week of intense cardio. Okay. And I'm going to go into a lot of detail in my next talk about that. But um, your main priority should always be weight training. Okay. A little bit of cardio is good, but not too much. And then obviously you want to sleep and rest. So sleep being seven, eight hours a day, ideally, and... You want to take at least two days off a week and do regular deloads every eight weeks. And that's it. So, hello, Jonathan. Hello. Okay. So, I first met you when you come to perform at one of my spoken word and music events. That's right. In, um, well, I think it was actually in Borsal Heath at the time. Yes, it was. Because you do some poetry. I which do. is really, really good poetry. But you've got another okay. hat you wear as well, don't you? You're actually... An author. I am. So do you want to tell us a little bit about your career with all of these amazing books? I can see in front of me here, there's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight books. <coughs> yeah, so uh, my background is originally dentistry. Uh, in fact, I went to university at the age of around 17. I've always had this fascination with the human body and I always wanted to do something related to medicine. So I went to university at a very young age, around 17 years old, uh, Guy's Hospital, mm -hmm. uh, where I studied uh, dentistry for two years. And then I left because I thought, I don't like this. Okay. I didn't get on with a lot of the students there. I was very lonely and very immature. Okay. So I thought, well, let me do something a bit different. So I decided to go to another university called King's College uh, which was also not far from Guy's Hospital, actually, in London. And I studied sports nutrition and uh, medical science for three years. Yeah. And that's how I got into the nutritional side of medicine. 
Yeah. Uh, by then I was a little bit older, so I decided to go back to university and I realised I wanted to be a dentist. So I went, to, went back to Guy's Hospital University and finished off my dentistry there. Uh, I was also, at this time, a bit of a side note, I was quite obese. Okay. Yeah, I, I was training a lot. I went to the gym all the time, but I was eating like a horse. <laughs> And over time, I gained a lot of fat, uh, 30% body fat by the time I was 22. And it wasn't a very good look for me. I didn't enjoy being overweight. Yeah. So um, all of these reasons is why I went to, uh, which, is, which is why I, I st- decided to study nutrition and try to get a better understanding of how the body works and everything else. Anyway, so that's that. I became a personal trainer in when I was 24. Um, by then, I managed to lose quite a lot of weight yeah. through my knowledge at university studying nutrition. So I was able to apply that to my clients and help them out. And also, it was great to make money at that time because I was broke. Never saw tomato ketchup bottle the right way up. Okay. You know? <laughs> yeah. Uh, so make any, any, money that, any money I made was great. Yeah. So all, all of that... Uh, that that kind of gave me what's the word? Um, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, confidence. Inspiration. Inspiration. Yeah. Inspiration to write some books later on about it. Um, as they say, a little knowledge is a dangerous thing, <laughs> isn't it? Yeah. So yeah, I had all that information, all that experience, being a personal trainer, going to university, and everything else. But when I was, uh, I think it was around two thousand nine, I lost my dad, and. Uh, they, that that was he, I lost him through cancer. Okay. Uh, which was strange because he never smoked, he never drank. He was a physically fit person because he was mm. a carpenter, always working all the time. We called him Superman because we never knew him to get ill. Oh wow! So when he when he had cancer and died six months later, that was a real shock. Yeah. But anyway, it gave me enough to look into why is it people die from cancer? Is it just smoking, drinking, or is there something else to it? Uh, and then I realised there's a lot of nutritional aspects to cancer oh a hell of a lot yeah and the eureka moment for me was one day i was reading a lancet article and the name of the article was you are what you eat yeah and we started talking about the benefits of vegetables and fruits and etc etc and how that could reduce cancer so that's really where it started off me having a four-year love affair with nutrition again yeah um, and as I said before, little knowledge is a dangerous thing. I thought I knew everything then. Yeah. After four years, I realised I knew nothing. Yeah. So I did four years of research um, before I wrote the first big book called The Essential Guide to Sports Nutrition and Bodybuilding. Yeah. And then I wrote five books after that. That's a long answer, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> no, it's not. No, it totally oh. isn't. So your first book was called the... Well, actually, the first book was called Lean Gains. Yeah. But... Um, that was, um, but but uh, the the essential guide was was the one that took me around three and a half years to write. And yeah, I can see it. It's in front of me. It's a substantial book, and it's an absolute amazing book. Thank you very much. It's eight hundred eight hundred pages, A four size. Uh, so yeah, that was quite a challenge to write. You've actually had um, because. You also do, in the Moseley and Borsal Heath and King's Heath area, when it's not locked down, you actually do some workshops and you do some events that promote health and nutrition and you are almost like the go-to person to ask all people's questions. Yes, I'd like to. Because I remember an event that you did in what was then the Ort and it was on veganism. Veganism, yeah, I remember that. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So what's your stance? How can you be... Fit and healthy, um, if you were vegan. Uh, yeah, well, you've got to think about what does it mean to be fit and healthy, first of all. Because a lot of people in Moseley and in this area, mm. and at the moment, at the moment, it is veganry, I think. Yeah, exactly, yeah, veganry. Um, vegetables, fruits and vegetables have a plethora of health benefits. And that was what I talked about that day. I think I spoke for an hour about the benefits of vegetables and how that can reduce cancer risk, obesity, diabetes, even tooth decay. Oh, Something wow. I know a little bit about tooth decay. <laughs> yes, yeah. you would do being a dentist. So I, um, I mean, there's so many benefits to fruits and vegetables. The problem is that you can't just live off fruits and vegetables without understanding the benefits of 
let's just say, I wouldn't say meat, because that's not true, obviously, but let's just say eating fruits and vegetables is not enough. If that's all you're going to do, you can't live off just fruits and vegetables. Some people say you can, but the reality is that you probably need to look at supplementation, like omega-3s and um, a vitamin B12 and certain things like that. But what about nuts? Doesn't nuts and seeds have the extra missing ingredients? It does to some degree. Um, so you're talking about omega-3s? Yeah, I'm not yeah. really sure. <laughs> the omega-3s, so yeah, you've got the, uh, the omega-3s in fruits and vegetables and nuts are called uh, ALA uh, omega-3. So there's three types of omega-3s. The ALA yeah. is the ones that you tend to find in the nuts. Um, nothing wrong with it, yeah. but the most of the health benefits come from the ones that you don't find in the nuts. Okay. Um, so the other two being the DHA and the EPA uh, omega threes, and this is just like one example. Yeah. Um, and they tend to be found in fish products. So I always say if you're a vegan or a vegetarian, then you may want to consider algae supplementation. Okay. Yeah. Or sometimes fortified foods. Okay. But which ones we don't know. So. To be honest, this I'd get the algae. Okay. Yeah. I also remember in one of your talks, mm. you spoke about how you totally transformed your body. Yes, I did. Because this is something that you are passionate about. Very much and it's so, yeah. lean gains. It's all talking about um, the actual health and fitness, the ultimate gym workout, how to get the perfect body. Um, the, uh, would you like to speak a little bit about that, your personal journey and how you transformed your body? into one that you're now proud of? Yeah, so uh, I went through, it started off when I was 22 and I was obese and I didn't really understand what I was doing because I was training all the time. I've been going to the gym since I was 16 and I've yeah. rarely taken time off that. So you'd think that I would be fit all my life, I would look good all my life, but my diet was awful. Yeah. And you get to a stage where you you think you look in the mirror and you don't like what you see and so i was thinking i don't like this so i decided to go on loads of fad diets which didn't work you'd lose the weight hit the plateau and come back up because you always hit plateaus and then you yeah. end up gaining the weight back so one day i decided to look into why is it that i keep getting the weight back yeah. why is it that i can't get beyond that point um and it just required me um stepping back and looking into the science behind fat loss and muscle growth. Um, so that's basically what I did. And I applied it to myself. And then within, I'd say within the first 10 to 20 weeks, I was able to lose around 15% body fat. Wow. Which is a lot. It's yeah. a lot more than people say is possible. But I was able to do that. And I put that down to what I learned at university and also reading um, very res well-respected science articles. What book, mm. if somebody wants to do what you've done, what book of yours do you recommend they buy? Because we will put a link to all of these books. How to Get article. the Perfect Body. How to Get the Perfect if you want, Body. If you want something, if you don't want any, like, if you don't want to go into the depths of it all, you just want something you can read in an hour, that will tell you everything you need to know. How to Get the Perfect Body, that's the one. Okay. But it's a no BS. <laughs> out of all of your books what are, what is the one you're most proud of the essential guide the essential guide of sports nutrition and bodybuilding because that 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 took everything out of me it uh, many 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 late nights and rewrites and it's taken around three and a half years to write so yeah i'm, I'm most proud of that book how many pages is it 800 pages Eight, and it is heavy it's it heavy is... and it's, that's also you can use it to work out with as well that's <laughs> and it literally yeah. is the essential guide it's got everything in it it does yes everything yes. is there any authors that you um had as your role models people you looked up to and people you respected yeah there was michael matthews uh there was lyle mcdonald who else was there uh Right now, the top of my head, I can't think of anyone else. There were it was, with with me. It wasn't so much the books; it was more the articles because I, I, there's a lot of journals. So I mean, for those who don't know, like you, you get fitness books. Yep. And a lot of book fitness books tend to be very opinionated. That's okay. my experience, and there are loads of fitness books. So you, they they don't have an objective viewpoint. So you might have one book written by a vegan, and all they talk about is the benefits of veganism, which is great. 
but that might not necessarily be where you're looking at. You might yeah. be looking at something else. So um, I found that another, another book might talk about uh, be written by a guy who's on a ketogenic diet and talk about the benefits of ketogenesis, but he might ignore other things. Yeah. Whereas with journals, journals tend to be objective. Yeah. More objective. It's 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 more written by scientists who don't really give a damn whether or not you're vegan or you're keto. Yeah. They just want to know does this work or does it not work. So most of the stuff I read were um, papers and articles. Yeah. And I read a few fitness books, but most of the information I got from were thousands of articles and papers. Wow, that's a lot of yes, research. thousands. That's why it took me. That's why it took me years. It didn't take me months. Years to write the book. <laughs> but then I could sit down and say, at least I know it's not just my opinion. Yeah. Uh, I, I tried to be as objective as I could. Yeah, I think that's what stands out with the books that you've actually written. I like the things so, because I don't preach to people. I say, look, there's good things about this, but there's also things you've got to look out for uh, without me trying to sell something to somebody. We, and I notice now you've actually got a recipe book. Yes, I think What's made book. you to a recipe book? There's a missing ingredient, pardon the pun. That's the missing ingredient to my book collection. It was, yeah, it's all well and good me saying eat more veg or eat more this or eat more that, but what vegetables and why? And... What if you want to count calories? How many calories? So I tried to write a recipe book which would satisfy all diets uh, and at the same time, from a health point of view, not just tasty food, but I'm thinking tasty, healthy food. Um, and then focusing on things that can reduce bloating or uh, foods that can uh, reduce appetite. Um, things like that. That's what was my focus on. It. Even things that you can take when, you, when you're fasting, which is uh, dichotomy. Like you think, can you eat anything when you're fasting? Well, you can't technically eat, but you can drink certain things. Okay, which, what which can you ones. drink when you're fasting? You can drink anything less than 50 calories. Now, someone will sit down and say fasting technically means you can't have anything in your mouth. Yeah. Which is true. But if you're going to be... A, the scientific definition of fasting means um, not having anything that's going to affect your insulin levels. So that's not going to change your metabolism. Okay. Um, and te technically speaking, anything less than 50 calories uh, during a three-hour period will not affect your insulin levels. So you can still remain in a fasted state without having anything above that. So if I think to myself, why can't you have anything below that then? Like, for example, green tea with a little bit of stevia in it, for example. You can still drink that and still remain in a fasted state. From well, a scientific point of view. Mm. But a religious point of view, some will say so you break your fast. Yeah. But scientifically, no, not necessarily. Well, isn't that interesting? I did not know yeah. that. So I've got that as well in the book. Okay. That is really... So if somebody wants to buy your books, how do they get hold of them? Leangains.co.uk, my website. Okay. Now, if you don't want to buy from my website, then uh, you can get them all from Amazon as well. So all of your books. I notice mm. you're actually wearing the clothes with Lean Games yes, as well. That's my next move. I'll be, um, hopefully in the next few months, I'll be selling clothes as well. Okay, um, very online. nice clothes. So you've got hats, you. you've got tops, you've got everything with the Lean Gains uh, logo. Lean Gains bags, um, Lean Gains water bottles, uh, Lean Gains caps, uh, Lean Gains underwear even. Yes. Really? <laughs> Lean Gains socks, yeah. It's all coming out in the next, I'd say, the next four or five months. Wow. Yeah, so that's so it's going plan. to be a brand as well. That's my plan, yeah. Have you finished your books now, or is there another one there? Uh, the only thing I don't, um, which I, I will finish by next month, is my audio book. So the, the Lean Gains book, uh, that, that I'm, also, I'm working on an audio book version to that. So for anyone who doesn't like to read, they can hear it in their car. Oh, that's really, really yeah. good. And can we see you? Are you going to be, when lockdown's finished, are you going to be doing more shows and more 100%, events? hundred percent, yeah. I had loads booked before lockdown. I had 20, 20 um, things, what do you call it, talks. And then they were all, well, well this wasn't going to happen, was it? So, okay. uh, yes, yeah, so there the, 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 the are some I will be doing online as well, um, uh, through Zoom. So I will be doing some Zoom talks as well. Okay, so keep your eye out if you want to have a look. Go on to um, his site, and I'm guessing they're all well advertised there. They will be, yep. Leangames.co.uk. And what I do know is you 
embrace people asking questions. Absolutely. I think if you don't ask, then there's no point being there. Okay, so... <laughs> you can edit that. <laughs> no, no, you can ask, ask if you like. Okay, ask so you everybody like. out here that's reading this article, if you want to know anything about health and fitness and nutrition, is this it's okay to actually message you on Lean's Gains? Yeah, Lean Gains, so that's L-E-A-N-G-A-I-N-S dot co dot UK. Um, there'll be links there. So if you go to the contact page, you can ask me anything. Um, contact us. And then, um, yeah, so, and then also I'm on Instagram, Facebook. All the links are on the website. So you can contact me through social media as well. Okay, so we're now in spring. So what is your top recommendation to get everybody fit and healthy for the upcoming summer? I believe in baby steps. So the worst thing you can do is go from eating the way you are to going on a cabbage soup diet. <laughs> so I believe whatever you do, you want to focus on baby steps. Baby steps meaning that, for example, uh, this week you can focus on, if you don't do any exercise at all, then start walking around the block a couple of times a week. Something simple like that. You add to that every week. So. The second week it might be implementing weights if you have weights at home. Uh, obviously, I would suggest buying one of my books, especially <laughs> The Ultimate Gym Workout, because that's got loads of exercises you can do. Um, and the other thing that you're going to look at is your diet. So again, keep it simple to start with. Uh, cut out all the junk food. Do that for your first week. It's veganary, so maybe increase more vegetables. Um, uh, drink more water. Don't drink any fizzy drinks, things like that. So do very simple to start with. And then you add to that because as time will go on, your energy levels will go up and you'll feel more naturally inclined to do more as time goes on. So I say keep it simple to start with. And then towards the end, when you want something more specific, uh, my book, my books will cover everything you need to know. Okay, thank you. That's Thank you, cool. Jonathan, and we look forward to seeing you when you're out and about doing your events again. Yeah, I definitely look forward to that. Okay, thanks.